I could just sit, I could just sit and wait for all your goodness, hope to feel your presence, and I could just stay, I could just stay right where I am and hope to feel you, hope to feel something Cause you 
Hey VAC and welcome to our drive-in weekend where we'll be joining you from up high on the roof of VAC. If you're in the parking lot, hello, and if you are cozy at home, a big hello to you too. No matter where you're joining us from today, we are so excited that you're with us. My name's Kim and before we get going on the service, there's a few things that we want to make sure you're up to date on. It is definitely the perfect time of year for a campfire and so many of you seem to agree because you would not believe how many signups we've already seen for fireside chats. But we want to see even more. If you haven't signed up yet or if you're still wondering what fireside chats are all about, head over to vernonalliance.org slash fireside chats to find out everything you'll need to know. And while you're there, why don't you register? This is the perfect opportunity to form new relationships, have valuable conversations, and gather in person outside in our beautiful city. We can't wait to see how many groups gather across our community. We're in the middle of our spring series, Re-Jesus, and we've heard so many great messages already in the last several weeks. But next weekend, we get to hear from you. We're planning something called Five for Five, and you're definitely not going to want to miss it. We'll get the chance to hear from five members of our VAC community, and you just might recognize some of these names. Adrian Bailey, Samantha Reeves, Brenda Richards, Lisa Hovenshield, and Dan Drott will be sharing with us their perspective on who Jesus is. There's going to be some rich teaching and new perspectives that are going to be so valuable to hear. We know you'll want to join us on May Long Weekend. As always, you can find this information and even more at vernonalliance.org and our social media accounts. They're your online hub for everything happening at VAC, and that's where you'll find us outside of our weekend services. Speaking of the weekend, we've got a great one planned for you today, including a message from that special guest we've been hinting at all week. So I'm going to turn it over to our team who is live in the parking lot of VAC. Thanks again for being with us today. It is so great to see you. All right, welcome here, everyone. Drive-in service, look at that, people are waving, this is awesome. We're gonna have some fun tonight, and the first thing that you're gonna need to do is remember a phone number, because we're gonna play a little bit of trivia. So you can text the answers to this number, and if you win, you will get a prize. So the number is 778-747-3828. I'm gonna say that again, 778 778- 747-3828. And this is not just for you lucky folks in the parking lot. You can also play online because whoever texts me the correct answer first, you win the prize. And you, if you happen to not be here tonight, then you can pick up your prize during the week. But if you are here, we'll ask you to just flash your headlights so that we know where you are. Also important is when you text the answer to me, also text your name so that we know who you are. Because if I don't have you as a contact in my phone and I just get a number, I don't know who it is. So, let's try with a question. There are several women that are named in Jesus' family tree. What? Give me one of them. One woman that is named in Jesus' family tree. Wow, the texts are just flying in. Well, that's, that's, that's wrong, but thanks for playing. Uh, no, that's also wrong. Well, come on, you people. Not, not, okay, we got a winner. Uh, Rick and Lynn O'Dwyer. Yes, I see that hand. All right. Go run them a prize in the white GMC right in the middle of the parking lot. Yes, thank you. People are also texting me saying I'm on the roof. I am on the roof. Um, second question. 
Jesus was born in Bethlehem. What does the name Bethlehem mean? What does the name Bethlehem mean? All right. Okay, we have a winner. That was fast. Joseph Sicarni. House of Bread. Flash, flash your lights. Where are you? Okay. Good answer. Those texts come in fast and furious. Yes, they do, Chet. All right. This one's going to be easy, so you're going to have to be fast. What was the town called where Jesus performed his first miracle? The town where Jesus performed his first miracle. Oh, we have a double winner. Oh, Joseph, you're so quick on the draw there. You want a second prize or you want to give it to the next person? Uh, no. No. <laughs> Okay, I'm still waiting for the right answer then from somebody else. All right, Volker and Angela Otto, are you guys in the parking lot? There they are, way in the back. All right, question number four. Uh, from what is recorded in the Bible, how many people did Jesus raise from the dead? Uh, no, it's not one. It's more than one. Uh, it's more than two. All right, Joseph, you got three again. You're a third-time winner. Wow. Five, four, no. Okay, Tony Ireland, where are you? Are you in the parking lot? Is that... Tony Ireland, where are you? All right, the answer is three. There was a widow's son, Jarius' daughter, and the one that we all remember, Lazarus. All right, we're going to cut it off right there and move on to other things. Thanks for playing, you guys. Hopefully that was fun. My phone kind of blew up on me. And now that I've got all your phone numbers, look out couple uh, bits of housekeeping for those of you that are in the parking lot. If for whatever reason you need to use uh, the washrooms, the washrooms here underneath are available for your use. You've obviously all got the radio station, so I'm not going to even bother telling you that again. And you've probably already all been informed that you're not supposed to be honking. We're, we want to be uh, kind to our neighbors. Uh, maybe tomorrow morning we're going to do the Brian Adams Wake the Neighbors concert, uh, but tonight we're not going to do that. Um, also, uh, Chet just wanted me to uh, announce that there is a grad retreat happening on May 29th. You need to contact Chet. And this is not just for those students that are graduating from high school this year, but also those students who graduated from high school last year. Lots of things got missed, so we're going to tr try and catch up a little bit on some of that. Also, as has already been hinted at several times, we've got a guest speaker tonight. I think you might all recognize his accent. And uh, just a reminder, some of the typical things that we go over when we uh, greet you, um, fill out a connection card if you are new. We'd love to get connected with you, know who you are, and, and help get you integrated into the life of the church here. Uh, also, again, up on the screen, there will be the different ways that you can give uh, to the work of Vernon Alliance Church. And if you are on uh, today online, um, you can also uh, use the prayer chat again. I uh, want to just really encourage you to do that. Uh, speaking of, just some interesting dynamics this week. Uh, one of the reasons we have a guest speaker is because uh, Jason was encouraged and told by the health authorities that he needed to self-isolate because he had been in close contact with someone who tested positive for covid uh, Jason wanted me to tell you that he's feeling excellent, he's had no symptoms, and he's only got a couple more days of isolation to go, so uh, that is good news. Um, other bit of family news that I do need to pass along, many of you will probably already have heard this if you know Eves and Sandy Boulin. 
uh, Sandy Bulin passed away uh, yesterday morning, and she's now with the Lord. So uh, Eves would covet your prayers. It's already been, obviously, a long, hard, difficult cancer journey for them, and for him now, the journey continues, and it's still hard. It's just different. So uh, let's remember to uphold them in prayer. And if you know them at all personally, uh, do reach out to him uh, during this time. That would be much appreciated. Uh, with that, as we head into our time of worship together, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, and we thank you for your kindness. We thank you that we get to live where we do. We thank you for this beautiful North Okanagan day. Uh, I thank you for those that are joining online. I thank you for those that are in our parking lot and that uh, we get to do this a little bit differently, and yet the reason we've gathered is to worship and to be instructed by your word. And so um, would you minister to us as we have need? You know each of us. You know the types of weeks we've had, the challenges that we face, uh, the joys that are ours, and the, the challenges. And so uh, would you... Would you speak to us, and would you minister to us, and would you allow us to engage in worship, even if it's in the confines of our home or in our car? Uh, I pray that you would just really fill us with your spirit, that we would be engaged and responsive with what you want to do uh, with us this evening. Um, Lord, I want to also just specifically lift up Eve's tonight and ask that you would minister to his heart, would you wrap your arms of love and compassion around him? Might he know your presence uh, at this time? And uh, I thank you for his faith, and I thank you that he's also got the support of family during this season. But, uh, yeah, we just ask that even in the, the weirdness of having to plan a service with all the restrictions that are in place, we ask for your mercy and kindness and that he would see your faithfulness in these days. And so as we come to worship, we, we give you our hearts and we give you our adoration and ask that you would be blessed tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'll turn it over to you guys. Thank you, Will. Well, welcome, everybody. Whether you're here in your car or you're at home, uh, we want to just welcome and say thank you for joining us here uh, at church uh, this weekend. Um, it is such a beautiful day out, and we are sweating a little bit up here, but we're just so ready to sing. So why don't we do just that? It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Ties, I need you. Oh, God, I need you. Oh, your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like sound of the symphony in my ears. It's like, oh. Sweet, sweet honey on my lips 
of your love because of your love we're forgiven because of your love our hearts are clean we lift you up Songs of freedom forever we're changed because of your love. We're forgiven because of your love. Hearts are clean. We lift you up. Songs of freedom. Because of your love, yeah, 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 yeah. So I don't know if we mentioned it, and we may have forgot to, but if you were wondering where the lyrics are, we do have them on the website. And I do believe they were sent to you when you registered as well. So if you were wondering where those were, you can find them there. Um, but we're going to sing this next one. And we're just going to talk about how, uh, tonight we're going to talk about how Jesus comes and he, he casts away our demons and how he, he takes us as we are and he cleanses us. Even when we feel like a lost cause to ourselves or to other people, God comes and he rescues, he saves, he cleanses, he purifies, he redeems. And so we're going we're gonna to sing about just coming to God and come to the altar and, and just basking in his love and his grace for us, um, that his, his arms are open to us. So let's sing that. Jesus 
right. Thanks, you guys, for leading us. Uh, along with all the other things that you should have gotten when you registered was uh, a responsive reading. We did this at the Easter drive-in, and so we thought we'd try it again. Uh, those of you at home, also, you can find this on the website. It is there available for you, so maybe you can uh, pull that up quickly on your device. It's a responsive reading about the immeasurable greatness of Christ, and you'll notice if you've got it handy there, uh, I will read some things, and then we can say some things and affirm them together. So the immeasurable greatness of Christ. Jesus, your Father, raised you from the dead and seated you at his right hand in heaven, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and gave you a name that is above every other name. And he put all things under your feet and made you head over all things for the benefit of us, your people. Jesus, you are the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by you all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through you and for you. And you are before all things, and in you all things hold together. Jesus, you are the head of the body, the church. You are the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and the first ahead of everything. In you all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through you to reconcile to himself all things, making peace by the blood of your cross. Jesus, you humbled yourself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted you and given you a name that is above every name. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Amen. Amen. All right. And with that, uh, you finally get to meet our special guest speaker uh, coming to you live on the rooftop uh, of Vernon Alliance Church, former pastor of our fine congregation, uh, Stuart McKnight. Is he still here somewhere? Come on out. All right, Stuart, good to have you back. How does this feel? Okay, I think I'm on. Yeah, you are. Welcome here, Stuart. Thanks, Will. Uh, You're going to sweat a little bit tonight in the sun here, but it's good to have you here. Hey, church. Lovely to see you. Um, thanks, Will. Thanks, team. Good to be uh, good to be back for this unusual experience that we're going to share together this evening. But uh, it's a treat. It's, it was unexpected because I was asked, I guess, last minute, but I'm glad to be able to assist um, Jason and the team by stepping up this weekend, what with some quick changes of circumstances on his behalf. But, uh, yeah, lovely to be here. Just give me a moment to get my bearings, and I will uh, proceed to tell you some things that have been going on. We good? Hey, Bell. Front row as usual. Good man. No, I'll be all right. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so the radios are working all right. Okay, good for you. And then hopefully everything at home is working well for, for everybody. Yeah, so I never quite imagined myself doing this, but I, uh, I'm glad to be able to step, step in and to assist, uh, like I said, assist Jason and the team uh, under these unusual circumstances. Now, although this is a bit odd, me standing up on the roof uh, talking to you folks in your cars and you folks at home from a roof, we're, we're really actually just doing church, aren't we? The people of God throughout history and throughout all kinds of circumstances have tried to get together to worship, to pray, and to bring their lives around God's Word. And so I guess that's what we're still doing, uh, despite the, uh, this distance this distance, which Bonnie Henry would be most proud of, I think. Um, what with it being on a roof? Uh, it's also a little bit unusual for, for us, perhaps, because 
the last time we were together, we, we were doing this in a nice room inside. But the last time we did this, we were bidding each other a fond farewell, and the McKnights were uh, presuming to go on the next adventure back over to Scotland. And obviously that has not materialised. Um, a few reasons there, just quickly, because of Brexit, immigration rules had changed, which we hadn't realised, and so that complicated our application somewhat. And then also, just when that was unfolding, uh, COVID hit, and so that completely put a, a complete stop to all of our international plans. So we're still here and still actually really enjoying living in the Okanagan and having to reinvent ourselves a bit in some unexpected ways but uh, still very blessed and grateful for the lot that we have been given by God. Um, a few of you have asked whether by email or just if I bumped into you around town uh, how my parents are doing because one of the main reasons that we were moving back to Scotland was to be in close proximity with my parents and uh, they're actually doing incredibly well. We haven't seen them face to face for about two years now. But uh, despite the circumstances, they're doing really well. Um, the UK got hit way harder and faster with COVID than Canada did. And so they've had far more significant restrictions long term. Uh, but they're beginning to ease. And so they're really enjoying a little bit of new liberty in their lifestyle again. And we're very blessed that their health is holding up and maintaining quite well. Uh, they've had their COVID shots. And so it feels like things are returning a little bit to normal and they're appreciating uh, appreciating that. Um, let me give you, again, I've had a few questions, so let me give you a, a really quick family update on where we're at and what's, what's going on uh, in and around our, our family. And then we will jump into a beautiful story from Mark's Gospel together. Uh, so let me talk about my favorite people for a couple of minutes. Um, so Teresa is doing brilliantly in our home and with family and with her own interests and developing her own music and also uh, with some work, keeping busy and enjoying, um, just I think enjoying this new invention of life that we're going through together. Scott, my oldest son, has graduated university. Um, he graduated with two degrees, one in uh, economics and one in theology. And he is currently starting his own business, and I'll start. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and he's now happily married to Lydia, and Lydia is this lovely new addition to our family. And she is a clinical nutritionist, and she works in the Salmon Arm Hospital, and she also has her own online business to uh, care for people uh, through nutritional needs. Uh, my next son Taylor, he also, amazingly, graduated university. And uh, in what did he do? He did environmental studies and a minor in theology to keep his dad happy. Um, and he's now currently local and he's working and he's enjoying music and doing, doing really well. Uh, my next guy, Lewis, he is, he's completed his third uh, level of Red Seal and is going for his fourth sometime pretty soon, hopefully. He's working in construction. Uh, loves building houses, he's doing a great job, working hard, and he and Taylor actually moved out recently together, and that seems to be going uh, really well for them and for us. That, that's all, all good. Uh, next, we have Ross, and Ross is working at Cal Tire full-time, at the one over near Cal Lake, and is loving his job there, changing tires, fixing cars, and get to drive some cool vehicles, and so he's a, he's a happy camper. Uh, Bella is in grade 11, and so she is in, at VSS, and she's also doing her hairdressing certification, uh, working really hard, loving that. She works at Spruce Salon down in the main street and uh, is, uh, is enjoying that process and working hard there. Then we get Charlie, our youngest. Charlie is 10, and he is in uh, grade... Oh, I think he's in grade 5. Yeah, I think he's in grade 5. I should know that four or five. He's in grade school. Um, he's getting homeschooled this year, so it doesn't really matter what grade he's in. Um, so anyway, he's at homeschool because the masks and all the tiptoeing around at school, it wasn't working great. So um, he's, he's helping look after all the animals that we have on our little acreage now because uh, we're dabbling with some farming things. And that's, uh, that's great. Charlie loves it and it's going well. 
And then for myself, I'm working on my completing my master's. I'm kind of on the home stretch. I'll be working, diving into my thesis soon. So that'll be a year of uh, pretty hard work getting that done. And I'm also doing a bit of, uh, I guess, contract work and teaching for our Alliance District office. Um, they run an ordination track and the, there's theology and doctrine. So I'm the theology guy that uh, I get to teach about 30-ish new pastors um, some theology and doctrine and every uh, two or three times a year get together I do the teaching and, and that's, uh, that's a process that we're working through together and that's, uh, that's really enjoyable and it's really challenging so that's been going quite well. I've also got an online teaching um, website business which is called theologynow.ca theologynow.ca and what it is is every week I upload just short five or six minute theology videos and talk about the most important things that I think we ought to be talking about, which is God and the, the truth of the Bible. So I do that every week and um, there's all kinds of different resources on there. So if, you, if, you, if you're curious, then you can check that out. And if you've ever wanted, actually, if you've ever wanted to be a patron of theology, um, then I could make your dreams come true and we could uh, partner together and that would be lovely to connect with you through that. So that's theologynow.ca. There's resources and opportunities there. Okay, so that's our family update. And so thanks for those who have inquired at a distance uh, over the last few months. So now we're going to have a little look together at, it's, it's probably one of my favorite stories in the Gospels. Um, if you're allowed to have favorites, this would be one of mine. Because what it does is it gives, a, this story gives a startling uh, exposure, a startling disclosure of both the satanic agenda for humanity, but most importantly, it gives an incredible vision of the divine agenda of God's heart for humanity. And it's just this brilliant story of uh, extraordinary transformation occurring through the authority and the word and the, the grace of our Lord Jesus. So if you have a Bible, uh, I'd like you to turn to Mark chapter 5. You might have a, a real Bible. You might have a digital Bible. I don't know. You can turn to Mark chapter 5, and it's at verse 1. And it's just this really um, intense story, actually, that we can get caught up in quite quickly. Mark chapter 5. They, that's Jesus and the disciples, came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived amongst the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains. But he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and, bru and bruising himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to see Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had, been, who had had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them uh, described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by the demons begged him that he might be with him. 
And he did not permit him, but he said, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, this story is, uh, I don't know, it's just such a wonderful story and such a vivid uh, exposure of both the worst and the very best uh, in the kingdom of God. So Jesus visits a place at the beginning of this story that he doesn't normally go to. It's called the Gerasenes. So it's, he does most of his ministry around the area of Galilee or in Jerusalem. The Gerasenes was the far side of the lake. It was south and east. And he, he never really ventured there because it was a very Gentile part of the world. There was lots of Roman garrisons and towns and cities scattered around there. So there was lots of non-Jews there, the Gentiles. Most of the area of Galilee, a lot of that was Jewish. So Jesus really ministered most of the time around about Galilee. At this point, he goes over to the Gerasenes. As he gets out of his boat, this man that we've just had described to us, he runs up to him. Now this fellow, we're going to just think about for a minute. He, he is what you could call the, the embodiment of the satanic agenda for humanity. And when you look at it, when you really absorb this fellow's existence, is is actually pretty shocking. We're told that he lives in the tombs. We're told that he lives in the place of the dead. That's where he had been driven, or that's how, somehow where he had ended up in the caves and in the tombs, which was obviously a place that you would term as unclean. Any sort of grave or any place of the dead for the Jews was termed unclean. Uh, but this man had to actually even make his home there. We're told that he had been uh, accosted several times. People had tried to tie him up. They tried to tie him up with ropes. He broke the ropes. They tried to tie him up with chains. He broke the chains. Um, so this man had suffered terror and suffered violence at the hands of his local community. Why? Because they were terrified of him, because he was a madman. Because we're told what he does, he prowls around day and night. He never stops howling and yelling and cutting himself. He's restless. It's like he's this wild animal up in the hills. Later on, we're given the detail that he's clothed, which means the beginning of the story, when we meet him, he's probably naked or close to naked. So he's gone from being a human being. It's as if he's now just this wild animal, unkempt and violent, tormented by these demons, paranoid, this sort of madness that you can see as you stare at him in the story. His life, you could say, just in ruins, vandalized in pieces because of the spiritual torment against him and the circumstances which have just materialized around all of that. So this poor guy that we meet is profoundly and utterly lost. His circumstances, you can't really even imagine to be any worse than they are. Homeless, destitute, demon-possessed, naked, he cuts himself, he prowls, he screams and howls. He's a lost soul. And Jesus arrives at the shore when this guy is near the shore. Now, I want to stop for a minute and ask, well, why, why did Jesus go to the Gerasenes? What prompted him to break from his normal tradition of staying in Galilee? Why did he actually make his way down there? Well, I think the reason he was there if we have read through John's gospel, Jesus says something pretty interesting. Jesus says, I only ever go where the Father sends me. I ever, only ever say what the Father tells me to say. I only ever do what I see the Father doing. So Jesus is very clear, especially in John's gospel. He reiterates this a number of times when he says, I only really do everything and go anywhere and say anything that the Father already invites me into. I respond to the ushers of the Father and I make my way wherever. So almost certainly at some point between chapter 4 in Mark and chapter 5, it's like the Spirit of God whispered to Jesus. Something was ministered to him. So it's as if the Father said to him, listen, I want you to get in the boat and I want you to head south and east to the Gerasenes. Go to the wild country. Because there's a lost sheep down there. And he won't last much longer. He's so far gone. He needs an intervention. He needs your presence. And so Jesus, I believe, at the prompting of the Spirit, 
gets into the boat with the disciples, sail, sails in the wrong direction, and then when he immediately he reaches the shore, we're told that this fellow emerges from the tombs and sprints towards him. And when he reaches him, we're told he falls on his feet, or he falls on his knees at Jesus' feet, and he asks this question, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Well, how did he know who Jesus was? How did he know his name? How did he know his status? Well, we find out really quickly that Jesus wasn't having a conversation with the man at this point. It seems to be that the demons inside the man were the ones who were talking. And they were saying to him, we know who you are. You're the son of the most high God. What do you want with us? And then we have this really, uh, this really strange moment of conversation where Jesus actually has this dialogue with this demon host inside this guy. And Jesus asks him their name. He says, what's your name? And he says, Legion, because there's lots of us. Now, that, that's a very true answer, actually, because a legion in a Roman battalion, a legion was uh, a battalion of 6,000 soldiers. So that doesn't, I don't think that necessarily means that there's 6,000 demons in this guy. I think it just means that there's a lot, an awful lot. And he is completely and utterly, you could say, outnumbered and spiritually overpowered. And then the legion uh, of demons headed up by this one who is vocalizing actually asks Jesus for mercy. He says, listen, please don't cast us out of the country. Please don't banish us to wherever, you know, the, the spiritual place of prison might be. The, the demons actually say, look, can you send us into the pigs? And sure enough, just on the other side of the hill or just down the road, there was this whole big massive herd of 2,000 pigs. So they beg for mercy. These demons beg for mercy from Jesus. And amazingly, they actually receive it, which is very odd. Um, and so he evicts them from this man and sends them into the pigs. And then we have this extraordinary, uh, almost cartoonish moment when these 2,000 pigs panic and run with this spiritual madness down into the Lake of Galilee, and they're drowned. So th there's, a, th there's a strangeness. Um, and I, I'll have to be honest, when I, I get to this part of the story, it sort of troubles me. Um, and it sort of troubles me because I like pigs. Um, I mentioned earlier that Scott, our oldest son, he's starting a business, and it, it's, it's farming. He's starting a farming and a fine meats business, and his his business is going to be to raise and process pigs. So this story is, is it's a little bit of a, um, you know, a little bit bittersweet here. Um, we, we got into this because last year, uh, last year we, we got two pigs and we raised them on our little acreage and they were great. Like pigs are really fun, they're really social. Um, we got along very well. And so we, uh, we had those two pigs, we processed them, they're in the freezer, we're still getting along very well and um, they're, they've been a, a really welcome addition to, uh, to our groceries. But Scott loved the whole process so much that he's now jumping into this to start a little business, and uh, we're getting probably about 40-ish pigs this year, and he's going to raise them and process them, and he's got all of his license and planning and everything organized with that. In fact, a uh, weird story, this time last weekend, uh, Scott and I went on a quick trip to Alberta to pick up 12 little heritage piglets. So pretty straightforward, pretty simple project, right? Drive to Alberta, pick up piglets, drive them home, easy. Didn't work out quite that way. Uh, part of the journey that should have taken us four hours to get from around about Calgary to near Radium, it should have taken us four hours. It ended up taking us 16 hours uh, because, well, because of circumstances, none of them good. There was all kinds of stuff going on and we broke down several times with pigs in the back. We ended up actually breaking down for good, like totally breaking down in a little place called Briscoe, just north of Radium um, at 2 a.m. in the morning with pigs in the back. It was, a, it was like a weird out of body experience, the whole thing, uh, not to be recommended. So anyway, uh, that, that, was a, that was a strange event that happened to me last weekend in Briscoe. Um, Briscoe is the kind of place it doesn't actually exist. It's, it's, uh, it's a general store that sells, it tells you in the front of it what it sells, and it sells, uh, what was it? It sells beer and fireworks and pet supplies. That's it. So if you like those things, Briscoe is the place for you. But I did actually also notice that there is, in Briscoe, 
there is no disco. And I thought that that was a, a sort of missed marketing opportunity. Um, anyway, I'll, uh, I digress. We got rescued, though, from our uh, Brisco experience at, uh, the, later on, a few hours later, by Darren, our heroic neighbour, and BCAA working together. We got home, the pigs got home, and hopefully happily ever after. Anyway, so now you can understand, when I read this story of 2,000 pigs going down the hill and ending up in, in the lake, it, uh, it, it stirs something in me. But I have to get past that and realize that in the Gospels, there, there's, there's purposes behind everything. And there's a theological theme going on in this story, which is very real and very profound. And the theme that we can pick up on is the theme that there's, there's a lot of unclean things going on in this story narrative. The man lived in the tombs. That was a place that was unclean. The man, because he lived there, the man was unclean. The spirits, were told, were unclean. The pigs, according to the Jewish kosher laws, are unclean. So there's these layers of uncleanness in the story, and the point would be that by the end of the story, all of that has been washed away or has been left behind, that there is a cleansing that happens uh, with the ministry of Jesus here. So as we continue to read that and consider this, we come to what would be the pinnacle uh, of the story. And this is just such a beautiful place that, you know, we, we find ourselves in the text. The pinnacle of the story is when we're reintroduced to the man, when we realize that there has been this stunning and beautiful transformation happen. We're told these tiny little brief details, but they're so powerful. We're told that once the pigs had been dealt with and once you know there had been a bit of an exchange and the demons had been evicted and and the dust had settled we're told that the man was seated and that little detail tells us a lot why because the first image that we got of the man was that he was restless he was obsessive he was pacing and prowling and howling around the mountain cutting himself never resting sort of this sort of paranoid obsessive personality but now He's seated. What does that mean? Well, he's calm. He's peaceful. He's resting with Jesus. Something has happened that has, you know, sort of decompressed all that uh, insanity. And he is now seated with Jesus. We're told another detail right there that he's seated and he's clothed. So we can presume from that that beforehand he wasn't. And what does that mean, really? Apart from just the embarrassment of being naked, there's a sense of human dignity that had been taken from him or that he had utterly lost through the satanic uh, influence in his life. And now we're told that he is clothed, that his dignity as a human being, his dignity as a man had been restored. He was seated, he was clothed, and then we're given this other beautiful detail that he is now in his right mind. So he wasn't before. There was just a madness about him the demons had been evicted. The madness had now gone. The spells had been broken. And here we have presented to us this new man. You could say he has quite literally been born again. He met Jesus and he has been radically and profoundly and so quickly completely transformed in the best possible ways. And then the part of the story that's it's almost a little bit hard to listen to, but at the same time, it's absolute genius. The very ending of the story. Because the man, for the first time in perhaps decades, he had found somebody, he had found something, wow, completely transformational. You know, this man, Jesus, he evicts the demons and he loves me and he's, he's forgiven me and he's put me back together and this beautiful restoration. And you can completely understand this man now turns to Jesus and says, I want, I want to follow you. <laughs> I want to go wherever you go. I'm in. And Jesus says, no, no, you can't. And it's a little bit, you know, a little bit abrupt when you read that. But here's the genius of Jesus. What does Jesus immediately say to him? He says, no, you can't follow me. But I want you to go home to your friends. I want you to go home to your friends. So Jesus here understands that this man had a home. He had a place. He had people that loved him. He had a family. He had parents or siblings. He might even have had a wife and children. But he had a home, and Jesus says, that's where you need to go. 
I want you to go home to your friends. He actually says, go to your friends as well. So he had people that he grew up with, people that he laughed with, he worked with, he played with, people that were his community that had been torn from him, that the social fabric of his life had been ripped apart with his years in the, in the mountains. And now Jesus says, it's like, it's like Jesus saying to him, you've got to go back now and repair that. You've got to rebuild what's been broken. You've got to reclaim what's been stolen. You've got to regather what has been lost in your life. You've got to go home to your friends. But then he gives them like marching orders. He says, I want you to go home to your friends and I want you to tell them about what God has done for you and the mercy that he has had upon you. What God has done for you and the mercy that he's had upon you. So it, it's this missionary activity now that the man's invited into. into the, and, he, and we're told that he does. He, he's from the area of what's called the Decapolis. Now the Decapolis is actually a collection of 10 cities, 10 towns and cities just south of Caesarea Philippi on the eastern side of the Lake of Galilee all sprinkled down there, uh, all around the desert regions and the mountains there, these 10 cities. And we're told that the man went there and he was like a preacher. He went and he did. He told people about the grace and the mercy that he had received from God and what the Lord had done in his life. So, I mean, can you imagine the story that this guy could now tell? Like this is, this would be, utterly amazing because he could now stand he could go into a town and he could stand up and say listen listen everybody I was in the darkest hell you could ever imagine I was so far gone I was so tormented I was so alone I was utterly and completely lost and then he found me he came and rescued me and the crowd would yell out who found you who rescued you and the man could say, Jesus, the son of the most high God. Because those are the words that if initially came out of his mouth, even if it wasn't voluntary by him. He now knows Jesus, the son of the most high God, in this personal and transformational way. What a testimony he could tell. And I think that this story, the story of this poor man who was transformed and reborn and given a mission, given a purpose, given a direction. This echoes, I think, deeply to and through all of us in some way. It's not like we're all living in tombs and we're all being chained up and there's this wildness. But in every one of us, there's crooked places. In every one of us, there's this you know, spiritual uh, shortcuts or oppression that need liberty. There is uncleanness that needs repentance and forgiveness. There's restlessness that needs peace, needing our minds renewed so that we are even more deeply in our right mind. So this story actually speaks to us. Not The circumstances are, are different, obviously, but the power and the message and the ministry and the intention of God are still the same. To meet us wherever we're found and to minister into us light where there's darkness, grace where there's uh, violence, love where there's hate, healing where there is vandalism. And so we also get sent the same way this fellow got sent. This fellow was told, go to your home, go home to your friends and tell them. Just talk about what God's done. Tell them about God's mercy. And that's really the church. I think sometimes we maybe overcomplicate the whole, um, the whole thing, uh, but it's really it really boils down to this: that we're the people who have received God's mercy, and our role is to uh, encourage each other in that, and then go and tell, talk about what God's done, and tell our friends and our home and our family and our world about what God has done and the mercy that He has had upon us. So I just love this story, you know, though the complicated bit in the middle with the pigs. The main message of this is the grace of God, the love of God, the transformational authority of the word of Jesus to take the bits and pieces of our lives and rebuild us and mend us and send us in a beautiful new way. 
Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word that teaches us about the truth of your heart. And so I pray that the seeds that your word is will be planted in good soil and it will grow in the days and weeks and months ahead and will bear uh, a great harvest. It will flourish. The Vernal Lions Church will prosper and we'll know your grace and mercy in abundance. In Jesus' name, we say together, amen. Amen. Bless you, church.
So thanks, church, for your kind reception this evening, uh, for the waves and flashing your lights. Um, it'd be nicer to be closer, but it is what it is. And thanks as, as well to Jason for the invitation and the opportunity to step into uh, the moment. Um, yeah, it's a privilege. So may the Lord bless you and keep you, and he will make his face to shine upon you and he will be gracious to you, and he will turn his countenance towards you, and he will grant you his peace. For today and for all of your days, and God's people said, amen, amen. Bless your church, peace. Joined as one, I of love. 